Uh, thank you. First of all, I want to uh, actually thank Heidi because it's a wonderful opportunity for me to be here today to share something that I'm very passionate about. Um, I'm an audiologist and I've been practicing for well over 20 years and my interest in auditory processing disorders has actually uh, spanned over 20 years. Um, when I first started practicing 20 years or over 20 years ago and started completing the assessments, one of the things that I was amazed at is how many people really didn't know anything about auditory processing where it seemed to be such a fundamental element of the hearing system. Well, it's uh, almost 25 years later and I'm still running into the a lot of the same uh, issues and concerns that I encountered uh, uh, you know, 20, 25 years ago. So uh, thank you, and thank you for staying. Uh, I know it's been a long day. Um, so I have um, a lot of my information is written out, and um, I believe it should be in your handouts. This afternoon, what I'd like to do is spend some time really just discussing what central auditory processing is, uh, some of the characteristics of individuals with auditory processing disorders, and some of the differences between ADD or ADHD and auditory processing processing because there really is an overlap in uh, behavioral presentation and I think that once you begin to understand how the two symptoms and disorders overlap um, you start to realize that not only is there a high level of comorbidity but also when you're looking at a child it's often very difficult to discern between which children have ADD or ADHD and which children have auditory processing at first blush. Um, when you're looking at assessment um, what do you look for in an assessment and also management and assessment and management are very closely intertwined um, many mm -hmm. times when people are looking at assessment what is actually happening is that they're doing the assessment but there really isn't the follow-up with the management and if you don't have the management then your assessment doesn't give you a lot um, Unfortunately, auditory processing is one of those, I'm going to call hidden disorders. It's one that when you think about a child and you think about a child with hearing, you actually think, well, I've had my child's hearing tested and they can hear the sounds. And so if they, they can hear well, then everything should be fine. But we have to remember that the auditory system isn't just the cochlea. It isn't just the peripheral mechanism. And if a child can hear the acoustic tones, it tells me nothing about what's going to happen in a real-life situation. And so auditory processing, by definition, is the mechanism by which the auditory pathways and structures of the central nervous system extract and decode acoustic input in general and linguistic and general um, and linguistic in general and linguistic information in particular. Very simply put, it's what we do with what we hear. It's how the information goes from the cochlea to the auditory reception areas of the brain, and how does it get there? How is it transmitted? Is it transmitted completely? Is it transmitted efficiently? When we do the testing, we're breaking it down into a lot of skills that are required for listening in everyday life to make it functional. And I want to differentiate between auditory processing and what I'm going to refer to as listening. Listening to me is an active process. And so when you're looking at auditory processing, it's a physiological process. Listening requires that we do have good attention so that we're attending to the auditory stimuli. So to listen effectively, you need to have both good auditory processing and good attentional skills. Um, and I think that, and that is why sometimes you'll see a child who has an auditory processing problem and a child with an auditory processing problem will have poor listening skills. Um, but you can also have a child who has normal processing skills but poor listening skills for other reasons. And this is why we sometimes need to differentiate between what is the physiological process because how you address the issue and how you manage it is quite different. One of the things that I think is important to, to look at is a definition of what uh, central auditory processing disorder is. And one of the things I also want to mention is there is uh, a lot of discussion in terms of do we call it central auditory processing disorder or auditory processing disorder. Um, I, I think it really um, at this point is um, a matter of semantics. Uh, you know, it, is it really just a central disorder? Because the auditory processing uh, system uh, starts really with, with the ear and the cochlea. So where does it, the problem actually start? 
in my mind, it really doesn't matter whether or not we call it central auditory processing disorder, or auditory processing disorder, because we're still talking about the same thing. And if we look at a lot of the guidelines that have been written, um, you know, particularly in the states where they actually have some very strong guidelines and definitions, they actually uh, say that both terms can be used and should be used interchangeably. Uh, so auditory processing disorders uh, refer to the difficulties in processing auditory information in the central nervous system as demonstrated by poor performance in one or more of the following skills. Sound localization and lateralization, and, and this is something that you often see in very young children when you look at, at a lot of preschoolers. You know, can they find out where sounds are coming from? And so even though they have normal hearing, can they, if it sounds on the left, do they know it's on the left? If it's behind them, do they know where it is? If someone's calling from the other room, do they actually know where it is? Or do they have trouble localizing and finding those sounds? And I often find that in very young children when I'm doing um, hearing tests, you can actually see those kids who, according to the developmental level, should be able to localize very well, but their localization skills are not there in the absence of middle ear fluid or other things that could create those symptoms. So the first question arises, are these the kids who may later be at risk for some form of processing disorder? Another skill that we look at is discrimination. Discrimination is how we discriminate between sounds. When we hear the sound, do, does that individual actually hear the sound that we have said, or do they distort it? And you'll see this in kids who will confuse sounds like, like the, the P's and the B's, or they will um, mishear the endings on words, they'll mishear the vowel sounds. Auditory uh, pattern recognition um, what we're, we're looking at is uh, can they actually hear and retain the patterns of information. The temporal aspects, we're again looking at a lot of physiological skills where we're actually looking at how does the brain decode and sequence the information. Um, what ha happens when uh, information comes in from more than one source or if it's complex. A lot of these skills look at what is actually happening in terms of the rate at which the brain is actually able to process the auditory cues. If the brain is processing those cues at a slower than average rate, then that means that when the sound comes in, the brain's still trying to process one cue and the next cue is started. When we look at auditory processing and we look at the actual processing rate, to be able to process auditory information at a minimum, they have to be able to process process information at a better than a 40 millisecond rate or discern cues at a better than 40 millisecond rate. So even if that skill is at 45, that child is still going to be um, behind. Sometimes when you actually look at the skills that are required, in certain areas, the skills need to be processed even faster than that. So what we're looking at is some very rapid, um, the ability to process that information very rapidly. One of the things that we have to remember with auditory information is that it comes in fast and it doesn't last. Once someone has said the word, it's gone. And this is the difference between auditory information and visual information, because visual information is something which is there, and you can look at it, and you can hold it for a split second longer. But auditory information, when someone gives you a string of instructions, when you're carrying on a conversation, that information comes in, and in each sound, in each speech sound, you're talking about a number, a number of tones the child has to decode. And they have to decode that information and say, oh, that combination of, of formats means this sound. And every speaker is going to say it a little bit differently, but we're looking at that pattern of those, those two tones to, make, uh, to understand that every time someone says a regardless of whether or not it's a male or a female, it still means the same thing. When we get into the performance with degraded acoustic signals, what we're talking about there is what happens when people are at a distance. What happens when what they're receiving is not a pristine speech signal? And again, when we're looking at a classroom setting, much of what's happening is the signals that the children are receiving are degraded. When someone is talking to a child in a one-on-one -on -one setting in a small room with relatively good acoustics, what they're receiving is a good, clear speech signal.
in a classroom or in a gymnasium, that speech, or when you're listening to an announcement over a speaker system, depending on the quality of the speaker, often what you're receiving is not a really clear speech signal. So when you're looking at auditory processing, you want to make sure that all of those skills are intact. And a, a deficiency in even one of those skills is going to compromise how someone's going to be receiving information in everyday life. So by definition, an auditory processing disorder is a sensory processing deficit. And I think that this is one of the things that we have to remember. Audition is one of our senses. So it is a sensory processing deficit that impacts our lis the listening, spoken language, comprehension, and learning. Although I'm using a fairly old de uh, definition, I think that this one really sums up what we're looking at because if we look at how the um, sort of input-output functions or if we're looking at, you know, bottom-up or top-down, auditory processing is part of one of those bottom-up functions. You've got to take, be able to take in the information to be able to process the language. If you're not taking in the auditory information, then the language is not being processed effectively. So, um, and if you're not processing language effectively, if you're not processing the information effectively, then your comprehension and therefore your learning will be impacted. One of the other things that we need to also be very cognizant of is even though a child can have normal hearing, that if you have weak processing skills, the reception and term interpretation of that information is going to be compromised. Um, in other words, they have difficulty making sense out of what they hear. I think that at this point, because of the educational system that we're dealing with, um, I really want to spend a couple of minutes talking about some of the comments that have been coming up uh, surrounding auditory processing and really how do we address those and how, how do we talk about those. One of the things that you'll sometimes hear, and uh, those of you who deal with the school boards, um, may have heard this more, uh, more often, is that central auditory processing disorders do not exist. And in my mind, that is a complete myth. Again, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when there were only a couple of people in the province who really knew anything about auditory processing, there, wa there was some, I could understand where that comment would come from. Um, I could understand it because the testing was really just in its, its uh, you know, 25, 30 years ago, people were really just starting to develop very uh, better standardized tests. Um, and so a lot of the, uh, when children had auditory processing disorders, it really fell into the realm of the psychologist or the speech pathologist to look at the assessment. But things have moved along a lot since then. And at this point, we have neurophysiological studies. There's some work being, being done on genetic studies to look at the genetics behind it. Um, so that when you can actually do M MRI and fMRI studies and actually document the neurophysiological processes that are involved, you know that the disorder is a concrete disorder. Um, historically, if we look at but what auditory processing is and, and the interest in it, it really goes back well over 50 years. And some of the earlier tests that were done before they started adapting them for children were actually done with individuals with head injuries who had had head injuries in various areas of, of the brain, specifically the ones that were impacting the auditory areas. And the, the ability of those tests to identify and to pinpoint exactly where in the brain the breakdown was, was, uh, was phenomenal. And it's those tests, some of those tests and the research that was done at that time that is often used in a lot of the current tests which are now being used for children with processing disorders. So when someone says a processing disorder does not exist, well, we have to remember that the ear does not stop at the cochlea. And if we recognize that the, the information has to go from the cochlea up to the brain, that if you're assuming that for every child that that system would have to be 100% perfectly intact and all of the auditory reception areas of the brain would have to be working perfectly in every child, which, which is impossible. So by definition, a processing disorder has to exist. If people are questioning it, then they have to recognize that there are physiological studies and data that will actually support that. Another one, uh, and this is something that has come up, um, and people have 
a couple of people have made comments or uh, share this information with me, um, is that some people will say, well, auditory processing doesn't really fall within the scope of practice of audiologists or a speech pathologist can do the same kind of assessment or why do I need to have that assessment done? What information will it give me? But what they have to remember is that auditory processing is an auditory problem. And when you're testing for auditory processing disorders, you need certain types of equipment. And that the, you have to be able to control how the signals are going to be degraded if you're going to be able to evaluate it effectively. So even though uh, some people will say that you know um, speech pathologists can do certain elements, and there are many tests, and this is what we also have to remember, Within other professions, they will be testing uh, th tests which have the name auditory processing in it. And it is true because certain elements of auditory processing, and particularly as it relates to the phonological areas, you will say, you know, a comprehensive test of auditory, uh, uh, or, or the, the, um, a test of auditory uh, processing, and, and they'll have that terminology. But what they're looking at often is a memory-based skill or a phonological skill as opposed to a fundamental skill which looks at uh, the rate and the accuracy with which the brain is processing those auditory cues. Um, uh, um, CAA and uh, different uh, more, uh, I'm going to say, within the, co or I'm going to backtrack, within Ontario, uh, our current college does not have a specific position paper as yet on auditory processing. That is something which is in the process of being developed. However, if we look at it from our, um, our, our national guidelines, that they actually do very clearly uh, indicate that auditory processing falls within the scope of practice of audiology. Further, in the province of Quebec, they, uh, in 2008, they came up with a lovely document uh, which actually looks at guidelines and, uh, you know, preferred practice principles for uh, um, auditory processing disorders and uh, ASHA in the state, which is the, um, um, the national organization in the state and the national registration body, they ha um, have recently come up with a very good position and technical report paper for how auditory processing disorders should be managed. Um, on a more practical level, when we want to look at children with auditory processing disorders, what we really want to do is we want to start to think about what are some of the characteristics that you often see in people with auditory processing disorders. One of the more common ones is the, the difficulty with understanding spoken language, in competing messages, noisy backgrounds, or reverberant environments. This is one of the most obvious symptoms um, are one of the most obvious characteristics of children with auditory processing disorders. But again, when you're thinking about children with attention deficit, this is also one of the most common uh, um, and the most evident issues that come up. The children can't listen in a group setting. And so when you're looking at a child who has difficulty listening in a group setting, you have to say, is it attention deficit or is there also something going on? And it doesn't mean that a child with an auditory processing disorder will not also have an attention deficit because there is a high level of comorbidity between the two conditions. But you also have to remember that there may be something more going on. Um, with children with auditory processing disorders often misunderstand what is said. Again, children with attention deficits do, because they're not always attentive to the information, they again may misunderstand. So again, we have, have more overlap here. Um, children with auditory processing disorders will often respond inconsistently or inappropriately. Again, with children for other children with attention deficits for other reasons may respond inconsistently or inappropriately. Um, they both require uh, f uh, frequent requests um, for to have information repeated. Children with auditory processing disorders will often say, huh, or what? They will take longer to respond in situations where information is presented orally. And this is something which is really interesting to look at is when you have a child with an auditory processing disorder, often if you present the information visually, they will behave one way. 
and they will respond very differently. A child with a processing disorder, if you present the information verbally, they will respond up very differently. So they will mishear, they will ask for repetitions, they will misunderstand. If it's verbally presented, they'll become overloaded with the information. A ch if you take that same child and you show them what to do, then sometimes the response is quite different. And, and to me, when you actually are looking at children, if you're trying to sort of differentiate between different conditions, when you see discrepancies in how they respond based on how the information is presented, then you do have to start to question, are there other things which are possibly going on at the same time? Um, children with processing disorders have difficulty paying attention. They're easily distracted. Um, they have difficulty following um, multi-step uh, directions, localizing sounds. In early years, you will often find that these are the kids who have difficulty learning songs or nursery rhymes, or they'll, have, they'll be able to sing the song, but the words are distorted. They've definitely misheard the words. So they've got the rhythm, but they haven't been able to maintain the sounds. And again, recognizing that young children will have certain levels of misarticulation which are appropriate, but these are the ones that are unusual, where the vowel sounds are constantly distorted, or um, you know, the P's, B's, T's, D's are, are confused. Um, for some children, if we're, we're getting into a lot of the temporal processing weaknesses, they, some of these kids have very poor musical skills or they cannot uh, repeat a pattern. So that if they have hear a musical pattern, what they repeat back is distorted or the timing is off. Um, often children with processing disorders will also have uh, difficulty with reading, spelling, and le uh, learning in general. Um, when we look at children with processing disorders, you could tell from the, 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 the list that I just presented, there are, there's a lot of overlap between the two in terms of the behavioral presentation. But what we have to also remember is that not every child with an auditory processing disorder will have an attention deficit. Not every child with an attention deficit will have an auditory processing disorder. But from a behavioral point of view, if you're just looking at if you're looking at, at very cursory things in terms of, you know, uh, do they atten uh, are they attentive in class and, and are they able to follow instructions and are they able to, to sequence information, then there is a high level of overlap. One of the things, though, that we have to remember is that because they are different physiological processes, the neurological constructs, the, the neurological um, difficulties for each child are so different, and so therefore the management of each condition needs to be different. And so what we want to do is to really focus on a differential diagnosis to decide is it one or the other or is it a combination of the two so that we can develop the appropriate management strategies. Some very basic facts. Many individuals with auditory processing disorders do not have ADD. Many individuals with ADD do have AB, uh, auditory processing disorders. From the research that, that I've looked at um, over the past couple of years, the incidence ranges will be somewhere between 50 to 85 percent, and that's really depending on the test battery uh, that's employed. Um, so again, it is something to remember that may exist. Again, if we're looking at it from a school perspective, um, sometimes schools are more willing to accept a, um, an identification with an auditory processing disorder than they may be with ADHD. And so if we're looking, again, we're talking about how do we be practical. Um, you know, audit, as uh, Linda was mentioning, uh, uh, attention deficit uh, is, in many cases, an executive functioning disorder. But until such time as the school is able to recognize that, we also have to look at if there are comorbid conditions, will they accept that? And is that what we're going to have the children identified with 
to enable them to access the different resources in the school. And it's unfortunate that we have to play a lot of these political games. So it's not just in terms of the management, but it's also in terms of accessing the resources. I think that when we're looking at auditory processing, um, you know, the people who are providing the assessments for auditory processing should have some understanding of what uh, attention deficit is because, again, it's how you phrase the recommendations. Um, you know, there are many children with ADHD where when you look at the whole sensory processing of information and regardless of whether or not it's 100% auditory processing or, or a combination, some of these kids do need the additional um, benefits of things like movement breaks and, and really learning how to um, manage some, some of their, uh, their impulsivities. When you're doing the assessment, it's not just a function of, of numbers. It's also looking at what do I have to do to get that child to attend during that assessment. And so that factors into a lot of the recommendations. So indirectly, sometimes we can have those things included in the report, which can be of benefit to the child. So if you were to say, well, why should I test for auditory processing disorders? Well. Very simply, it can have an impact on an individual's academic performance, social interactions, and vocational opportunities. If you're not able to learn in school, then that definitely uh, affects your vocational opportunities. If you are not able to process information, if you're processing it too slowly, if you're processing in it inaccurately, it will affect your peer relationships. If you mishear what kids say, if you misunderstand what they say, if you take longer to process it, then your, your interactions with your peers are definitely going to be affected. Um, academic performance is obviously going to be affected. Undiagnosed and untreated or misdiagnosed auditory processing disorders can have lifelong learning effects. Again, early intervention is the key. If you identify the child early, you give them the appropriate co uh, compensatory strategies, you uh, look at what they require within the school system they, uh, and enable them to develop academically and understand what their strengths and their weaknesses are, how to self-advocate for themselves, how to manage the, the condition, then their, how they develop in life and how they're able to function in everyday life is vastly different from a child who, where it is not identified, and when you see uh, someone who is an adult who is, you know, uh, 35 or 40, and they, they've not been able to, uh, you know, go to university or college and not to fulfill a lot of their dreams because they haven't been able to process the information effectively, it really is heartbreaking, and it all at that point has had a huge effect on their self-esteem. Okay, so. Really what we're doing when we're uh, doing an auditory processing uh, evaluation is we're trying to determine if there are different remedial techniques or strategies that would be helpful to the child. The actual results, the purpose of the results would be to increase the, uh, the awareness of the disorder, to minimize any of the psychological factors, to promote it, uh, the appropriate educational planning, um, and to determine if effective interventions uh, such as FM systems um, uh, are, are appropriate. I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about the difference between uh, a screening versus a diagnostic uh, assessment. Um, many times when people are talking about auditory processing, and this is not just in the province of Ontario, but this seems to be uh, pervasive, is often people will look at a screening test and they'll try to identify a processing disorder based on the screening test. If you look at any of the current literature which is available uh, through, uh, through ASHA and through uh, various bodies in, in the states where they do ha currently have uh, specific uh, preferred practice guidelines, uh, they will clearly state that uh, an auditory processing disorder cannot be identified via screening test. The most common screening tests that are used within the province uh, of um, Ontario are really the first two. It's the SCAN-C and the SCAN-A. Um, and uh, other people have used uh, in isolation, um, you know, the, uh, the SAT, um, you know, and the, uh, and the TAPS uh, tests. But the first two are the ones that you will most commonly see in the province of Ontario. So just, again, to be aware that a diagnostic test and 
uh, screening test are, are completely different. A screening test is going to say there may be some areas of weakness, but it's really not going to tap into, in particular, a lot of the temporal processing aspects of auditory processing. Um, a screening test will give you some information if you're looking at one of the first two uh, in terms of whether or not they can f uh, filter out background noise and deal with the degraded acoustic signals. But when we're getting into more of the precise attention fo and focusing and their ability to deal with competing messages and their process processing rate, those are generally not included in screening tests. Um, when you're actually testing for auditory processing, the tests are designed to explore the efficiency of the system by overloading it or stressing it in different ways. And this is why you re require specialized equipment, because the signals that are coming in are de degraded or altered in a specific manner to see how the brain handles it. And the reason, again, that we don't test until children are about six is really because of the language skills, the attention skills uh, that are required, as well as um, there's a developmental process to the auditory nervous system. And if we, th um, we also have to recognize that from a physiological perspective, although the ear is the first system to develop in utero, um, the auditory nervous system doesn't actually reach full maturity until children are about 12 or 13. So that is why we have a huge developmental process going on. So it's not just in terms of the learned effects and how children learn to listen, but it's also from a physiological perspective that that system and the neural pathways are in the process of developing. Um, so when we're looking at the test battery, we develop a certain test profile and then we uh, try to look at the appropriate recommendations based on the test profile. General requirements uh, for testing, um, if we want to look at it from sort of a very pure point of view, we want a normal or near normal hearing. We want a language age of five to six years, uh, an IQ of 85 or greater. And uh, that is so that we can match them to age match peers. Now, there are times when we can do assessments. Um, the, the main uh, criteria really is um, the language age. For some children where they've uh, been identified with um, perhaps a slightly lower IQ, we can look at a functional assessment to say how are they going to perform according to the classroom setting that they're going to be in or what do they need to develop certain skills. So where, what are primary areas of deficit? So it assess, it's not that assessments can't be done outside of this box, but we have to make appropriate qualifications. But the primary consideration really would be the normal or near normal hearing and the, the language age of five to six years because the language used in the test the vocabulary is based on the language that you would expect in a child of five to six years. When we do the testing, we look at case history. Uh, we uh, look at perhaps some screening tests, some uh, uh, standard t um, audiometric tests. And then we move into, and I'm just going to skip through this, a lot of the auditory processing tests. And again, we're looking at trying to look at very specific areas. Um, the whole point of an auditory processing area is to try to tap into as many of these areas as possible. So again, a test, uh, an auditory processing screening test that has three, three tests is not going to be tapping into this. As, as well, what we're trying to do as much as possible is have tests which are overlapping. So we're looking at the same skill from two different perspectives to try to minimize how much is related to uh, you know, an, um, just a momentary blip in attention, how much is related to something else. So if you actually have consistency within the testing where you're saying that a child has weak um, skills in, in noise and you've looked at it from two or three different ways and it's still consistently weak, then you know that that's a real issue. If they excel on one test and they do poorly on the other test, then you know that there's something else going on. So it really, uh, so the testing is not just a function of, oh, well, I've done three or four tests. It's, you know, have you looked at the same skill from a number of different perspectives to make sure that your test battery is absolutely solid? When you're interpreting results, there are different ways of interpreting the results, and there are two very different models which are out there. Um, the reason I'm bringing this up is uh, because we need to recognize that how we interpret the information does make a difference. 
both of these systems are, or are very commonly used. They're both very good models for uh, trying to qu uh, quantify auditory processing disorders. Um, what we have to remember is that this, the person has used some system or some combination of the system and understands when you would use one model versus another model. When we're doing uh, and trying to manage a child, we have to remember that not all management plans are the same, that they have to be personalized for the individual. Ideally, we want a par partnership with the school system. Um, and most importantly, we want a partnership with the parents and the family. Um, I'm just going to skip through uh, some of this. When we're looking at um, management, what we're looking at is environmental modifications, assistive listening devices and compensatory strategies. So we're trying to target uh, and look at it from many different levels. Um, we can also look at some direct remediation. Although, and what I want to do is just spend a couple of minutes talking about why it's so important to say that we need to really specifically identify auditory processing disorders because depending on the profile that shows up, the type of intervention is going to be very different. So if you have a child with a prosodic deficit, and that's based on a certain pattern of scores on, on the, um, in the test battery, you can see that the first uh, recommendation for the child with a prosodic deficit is that you want a multi-sensory approach. However, if you look at the child with the integration deficit, you see that it's a totally different recommendation that they're allowed to look or listen. So you, when you receive the auditory processing results, if you're handed a standard recommendation sheet, you know, just, just a photocopy sheet and say, here it is, then that may not be specific to your child. Um, when you actually look at um, you know, some of the other recommendations, um, you, you'll find that for some children that you want an animated teacher. For others, you want a teacher who's going to present the information but without a lot of hand gestures and visual distractions because this child can't synthesize both pieces of information. Um, so I think that we need to be very aware of the fact that the recommendations and uh, the modifications are different depending on the nature of the difficulty. As well, when we look at the actual direct remediation, for one child, you're going to look at teaching them verbal re uh, rehearsal and you know, um, referring them to speech and language for social language, to deal with social language. For the, uh, for the other child, you're going to be looking at um, things that relate to interhemispheric uh, transfer um, and, the, again, working perhaps with the speech pathologist to really uh, look at being able to extract the schema from the, infer uh, from the verbal information. So, again, the inter uh, how you interact with the other professionals is also different and what you're asking them to do is different dependent on the disorder. I want to thank all of you for, for your time. Um, and um, thank you. I want to thank all of you for coming out today. And I want to tell you that this lady has changed many children's lives around by having that test. Because if your children don't know what they're hearing, all of the assessments in the world you do will only show for what they can't do, not what they can so go out there and fight for your kids, okay? Thank you, Teresa. Thank You're you. wonderful. Thank you. First of all, the connection is not well known and not uh, understood. Um, and secondly, schools cannot test 
for auditory processing disorders. Um, they, 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 um, to be able to test for an auditory processing disorder, you need very specialized equipment. But they don't talk about it, they don't recommend As, it to parents, they don't make that connection, they don't accommodate it in the classroom for Yes. Um, that's actually, I'm going to say, a loaded question, uh, simply because schools... If I look at it from my perspective, you're absolutely right. They should be making this type of recommendation. However, again, we have to look at it from a historical perspective, and a lot of the educators within the school system have not been educated in terms of what auditory processing is and what they've been brought up to believe. And I was at a meeting yesterday, and as one of the speech pathologists said, you know, she said, for the past 20 years, We've had in-service after in-service after in-service telling us that, you know, that all the recommendations are going to be the same and, you know, uh, we, we don't really need this assessment that we can uh, get the same information from other assessments that we already have. And uh, so that is the unfortunate reality that we deal with, which is why it is so important for parents to become well-informed in terms of what... Uh, is out there, what uh, they need to be looking at so that they can begin to advocate for their child. It may take much longer to re-educate a system um, because uh, whenever you're dealing with systems and, and you have to change systems and, and belief systems w within large organizations, that can take a very long time. Uh, OHIP used to cover portions of the testing, but that was delisted from the OHIP fee schedule actually eight years ago. The tests have standardized norms down to the age of six years. Different tests, though, have different um, basal levels. So some tests you can test at six. There are a couple of tests where you, it really is seven or eight. At six, you can get um, a very good indication, and you have some, some very good tests at six years old. A couple of the tests that require um, more cognitive, they need to cognitively understand the tests, and you're getting into more esoteric information um, that really is seven and a half or eight. So it really depends on who's doing the testing and whether or not they have one standardized test battery or whether or not they have a variety of tools available to them to be able to accommodate the six and seven year olds as well as the older age groups. Um, as, and in addition to the, uh, the young adults, because um, as Linda had mentioned with psychological testing, with auditory processing testing, there are different test formats for the younger kids and the older kids so what you're looking at and assessing and looking for uh, differs uh, by age group. Um, I would say you, you're probably looking at about a two-hour assessment. So it can be fairly efficient. Um, so you're not looking at necessarily hours. One of the things that you do have to be aware of, though, it is fairly intensive so that it's not just, uh, you know, like a high level and um, a very intensive exercise versus a very soft exercise. Usually each exercise is as intensive as the last. And so that is often why for, for children we will often break it up over two sessions, even though it doesn't seem like a long time to go in for, uh, you know, an hour it isn't long because they, they're in school all day and they do many activities for more than an hour because of the intensity we often prefer to break it up if there are significant attention concerns. Absolutely, or if you look at the behavioral checklist, and even if the CAP screen came back normal, because it doesn't assess all of the temporal processing areas, they could still have an integration disorder, which would be completely missed in the screen. Uh, so that if you, you look at the behavioral characteristics, and you're saying behaviorally, they're still coming out high, then, but the, the screen came back normal, then you still may want to go ahead with the full assessment.